Okay, I guess uh, we still have people joining us right now. Uh, we're 144, 156 now and counting. Um, yes, and I'm gonna wait for a couple of more seconds here, 150. So we have people joining from uh, Europe, uh, West Coast, East Coast, Chennai, checking here, Hong Kong, Singapore, well, thanks for the one joining us late. Okay. Um, well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. I'm really, really um, happy to have you all here uh, today for this webcast. Um, we've uh, our guest star uh, today, which is Melody Yashar. Uh, we also have uh, Safir Belali, who used to be our previous uh, panelist uh, for the last conversation we had in, in April that was around uh, the uh, the digitalization of product creation at uh, at VF and Vans. So he's going to be uh, co-hosting the conversation with with Melody uh, Yashar. And so for the one who doesn't know, uh, Kinestry Kinestry uh, is a uh, innovation studio. Uh, we base out of uh, Los Angeles, and we combine emerging technologies and human centered design to build innovative solutions. And, and our expertise is in the field of artificial intelligence, IoT, and virtual augmented reality. And so we, we've organized these um, webcasts. It's a monthly uh, um, series that we're doing. It's called uh, Innovation Augmented. And the idea is to explore the intersections of innovation as a discipline, design, and uh, emerging technologies. And so um, the discussion is just going to you know, make sure that people understand that the discussion doesn't stop here. Uh, we also have a, a, a LinkedIn group, uh, um, Augmented uh, Innovation, that I invite you to join. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of questions, I hope, today with the conversation that we have with Melody. So we won't be able to answer all those questions, but Melody, as well as Safir, will be on this LinkedIn group to answer all your questions. This is also the place where we're gonna be posting a lot of uh, topics around around the, the subject we're covering either today or in the previous uh, webcast. So having said that, um, you know, I would like to start with introducing Melody and you know, she has a pretty impressive um, uh, a career and, and uh, I would like to make sure I don't say anything wrong. So I'm gonna read that, okay? So Melody Yashar is a design architect, technologist and researchers. She is the head of architecture and building performance at ICON which is a startup pioneering the future of 3D printing houses for earth and space. Uh, Melody is a professor also at Art Center College of Design, uh, where she teaches life on the moon. Her background is in industrial design, architecture, and human computer interaction with an emphasis in robotics. Uh, Melody has been a senior researcher in human factors at NASA Ames via St. Joseph State University Research Foundation a co-founder of Space Exploration Architecture, Search Plus. It's a group developing human supporting concepts for space exploration. So, um, Melody, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for the introduction, Eric. I'm so excited and so honored to be here with you all. Um, Allow me a moment to just share my screen and I will kick things off with a presentation. Absolutely. Um, ready, set. Ready, set, go. Can you all see my screen? We can. Okay, excellent. Thank you once again, Eric, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak with Kinestry and with all of you today. Um, I'm really excited to be speaking with so many new and old friends and collaborators. I was just noticing the participants uh, who've showed up today um, and also some of you who've been so influential to me in this field, mentors and, uh, and, and those who are part of a broader space architecture community that has really supported me and encouraged new work to, uh, to appear and to, uh, and, and, and to proliferate. Um, Okay, I have a lot to cover today. So I'm going to read a few notes in the beginning, but I promise not for the entire time. Uh, let's start very broadly. Why space and why the moon and why Mars? 
Uh, I would argue that the impulse towards exploration and towards pioneering into new and extreme territories is a distinguishing and constituent feature of what it means to be human, so much so that we can say that it is a part of our DNA. Uh, the impulse towards exploration has, has been a part of who we are as a species since the beginning of time. Uh, two million years ago, man evolved in Africa, sorry, skip, skip the slide, and slowly but surely explored the planet despite obvious difficulties. And all throughout our history, we've noticed and we've observed that, that humans have been pioneers within these extreme territories motivated by the spirit of exploration um, and venturing into the unknown. And Beyond this, popular culture has also been instrumental in solidifying the language of space architecture designed for space and the way that we sort of imagine life in outer space and life in, uh, on, on the future of the moon and Mars. And it has been uh, an instrumental part of this idea of what it means to design for the future and of futurism in general. Um, in some ways, popular culture and design and design for space have always been mutually in influential to one to the other and have exchanged and cross-pollinated ideas. And certainly design innovation plays a part in that discourse as well. So these are some examples of the space habitat work that I've been involved in uh, since beginning this journey in 2015 with space exploration architecture. I'll talk about two of these projects today and then move into some of the more recent work that I've been doing with ICON. Um, in all of this work, the objective and the mission has been to conceive, investigate, and produce innovative human-centered designs which enable human beings to not only live but to thrive in space environments beyond Earth. And a consistent thread in this project, or I guess you could say a design part T with, within these projects, is not only to synthesize engineering constraints, but also to incorporate some degree of human factors driven design innovation and to really merge those two objectives. Um, we have evidence now and uh, not that we have evidence, but the reality that we're becoming a space faring civilization is now more real than ever. And I think that if, if there's anything I would like to sort of leave you with after this talk is that space architecture is one uh, discipline and one field that enables us to reflect on who we will be and how we will live once we arrive in these new worlds. Which of our earthly habits and tendencies will we cling to and preserve? And which of those habits and tendencies will need to change for the sake of adapting and evolving into a newfound home? And how will human life come to change days, months, and years into the future? So the three primary areas that we're looking at are orbital habitation surface and surface habitats on the moon and eventually on Mars. So you'll see a bit of, a bit of each in the work that's upcoming. The origins of space exploration architecture and of my work in this field started with the 3D printed habitat challenge, which is a NASA centennial challenge program that was kicked off uh, for a th with a 3D printed habitat competition that was a public comp competition that solicited what they call virtual designs, basically architectural designs for 3D printed habitats on Mars. Um, the, group, the groups that I was working with, Search Plus and Clouds AO, as well as Search Plus and Apis, Search Plus and Apis Correlator, very, very for, uh, fortunately for us, were able to win first prize in not one, but two of the final uh, levels in design within the 3D printed habitat challenge. It's a very unique and very, we're very lucky to have, been, have participated for as long as we did and then also to have won, not once, but twice. So these are um, the stages and the levels that we that I participated in within the 3D printed habitat challenge. You'll notice that it's both design as well as some construction prototyping. And I'll show you a little bit about some of the work that we did in both of those stages. So let's step back. What, is it, what exactly does it mean to 3D print a habitat in space? Um, 
in order to arrive at these very exotic and very sexy visions of future uh, uh, settlements and colonies on the moon and Mars, we need to start first bef uh, with some very basic infrastructural and civil engineering elements, very unsexy elements like roads, structural members, landing pads, silos, hangars, and garages. And this is really the focus of the work that I'm doing in construction technology today is this basic civic infrastructure that will enable us to develop these larger, more expansive ideas of cities on the moon and Mars. So first things, the first and most, I think, foundational principle about building on other planets is this concept of in situ resource utilization, which is ISRU for short. And what that means is using the local and indigenous resources of the planet, living on the land, by the land. And in this case, the resource that we're talking about uh, most frequently is soil, Martian and, and lunar regolith. Uh, how can we use that as a construction material to take advantage of the, of, of the efficiencies that it introduces in reducing uh, payload mass from Earth, which is going to be very, very expensive uh, when we start to think about how we want to ship and launch uh, habitats to the surface of other planets. So ISRU is one, is one way of thinking more sustainably and thinking more efficiently about how we can reduce that payload and use what is actually there on the planet uh, to construct habitats and other structures. Next thing we do when we arrive on the surface of the moon and Mars is we're going to have to prospect and locate an appropriate site for a habitat. And we're planning for all of this to happen in robotic precursor missions before people even arrive. Um, and then that, at that point, the site would be prepared, materials would be collected and stored um, and used as feedstock for 3D printing. And then finally, you can actually deploy your robotics to 3D print uh, your habitat structure and other uh, surface infrastructure elements. Um, largely, the research context in which a lot of this work happens at NASA and uh, other research agencies is within the con confines of a lab. But for companies who are leading the way in the future of additive manufacturing and the future of construction on earth, the immediate application is to produce uh, efficient and, and low cost housing alternatives um, that, are, that are going to radically disrupt the way that we build in concrete and in other methods here on earth today. And then of course the eventual application is going to be, is, 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 going, it, it is thought of to be for the moon and Mars. So we have our work for Earth and our work for space cut out for us. Um, Icon in particular is the only company and the only manufacturer of 3D printed buildings to actually have a, an occupant living in one of these structures today. So on the top right corner, you'll see that's Tim Shi. He is a member of the community First Village in Austin who is actually living in a 3D printed home in Austin, Texas. That is very unique. Um, I, I don't think that there is any other, uh, th that there is any other 3D printed structure to actually be lived in consistently and as a permanent home. Uh, so when we talk about applications for earth and space, there are three themes that I want to sort of, that I want to suggest uh, within the work that I've been doing and, and, and that, that function as a kind of thread within the habitat work that, uh, that I've been doing with space exploration architecture and beyond. The first is looking at building and construction methods that are regionally specific. The second is sustainable material innovation that enhances performance. And the third is automation that is cost and, and time efficient and that reduces risk. So those are three themes that follow in all of the space architecture work that uh, I've, been, I've been working on. In, in recent years. So to dive into the 3D printed habitat proposals very briefly, Mars Ice House was the first prize winner of the phase one 3D printed habitat challenge that was kicked off by NASA in 2015. What we proposed for this habitat was a double protective ice shell 3D printed out of water ice that would be mined uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and stored, low, that would be mined on the surface of Mars uh, and what we did here is we also introduced a pressurized ETFE membrane to prevent the ice from sublimating on the surface of Mars and oriented the program elements around a vertically oriented lander, uh, such as you see in this section here. We were interested in the time and the translucency of ice to provide 
a vision window to the outside, but this was still just a concept. This was just an idea for how this might be applied in the future. But we were interested in ice, uh, in, in, in the qualities of water ice as for providing translucency so that you actually have a connection to the larger and broader Martian landscape. Uh, the real kind of uh, value add, well, not well, not the real, the, the significant value add of this proposal and of using water ice as a construction material in particular is that water ice is a superior radiation shield against galactic cosmic rays and solar particle events over commonly accepted building construction materials such as alumin, aluminum and Martian regolith. So this was the, the key value add that I think enabled this proposal to really stand out amongst the others within the competition. Uh, we introduced two schematic concepts for how uh, 3D printing would actually happen both inside the habitat's inflatable membrane and then outside for the sake of printing a foundation out of regolith. And in collaboration with McGill University, we're able to do some preliminary ICE 3D printing testing. This is all using a binding material that would actually enable the a support structure to support the ice that would event that would need to be uh, uh, dissolved within a methyl ether uh, solution. But in any, in, any, in any event, that's the state of the art relative to ice printing. And here's the model of Ice House, which has sort of taken on a life on its own uh, after being exhibited internationally at multiple uh, museums, art museums. And uh, I'm very happy to say that a version of this model was acquired in the permanent collection of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art after their suits, habs, and labs exhibition that opened a few years ago or two years ago. Uh, a spin-off project, there are multiple spin-off projects as a result of these competitions. Uh, our work in the competitions was not funded. It was purely on a voluntary basis. And essentially the work that we did for that phase one submission was all done on nights and weekends uh, as a passion project, right? Uh, this was not like, this was not under the auspices of any organization or any institution. So it was really, yeah, it was really a passion project more than anything. Fortunately for us, um, despite the fact that we were not able to move forward with the Ice House concept internally with NASA, as it had been sort of assumed would happen uh, after the Centennial Challenges was over, we were able to be connected with the principal investigator at NASA Langley who was interested in the concept and in moving it further. Uh, and together over the course of two years, we collaborated on a proposal called Mars Ice Home. Uh, and with that team at NASA Langley, we came up with a concept for material layers that would be incorporated within the habitat, bladder restraint, uh, layers for the actual inflatable structure. And uh, we also introduced basic functional programming for a crew of four to live within this ice habitat uh, over the course of uh, a year long mission. We, uh, when I mentioned that we were interested in vision windows for Mars Ice House, um, but didn't have sufficient evidence to determine whether we could actually achieve the translucency that we were interested in. Thanks to some IRAD funding at NASA, we were able to do some basic prototyping with uh, ice within Tedlar bags, plastic bags, to actually determine if we can achieve the translucency that we were interested in. So here you'll see some SEM imaging, looking at the ice grain and determining whether we can actually achieve the mechanical strength to, to, to achieve a self-supporting ice shell within the structure. And then some additional work was done at NASA Langley with some, some very basic Tedlar bags that were filled and frozen, uh, filled, frozen, and then thawed and freeze, frozen and thawed over and over again until failure to determine how exactly ice behaves when it expands within these basic ice shells. And this experiment was sufficient for us to actually be accepted into the Materials in Space Science Experiment, MISI for short, which uh, sends small material samples in petri dishes aboard these uh, equipment cases up to the International Space Station to test them for, uh, to test them against space radiation. We produced one image sort of insinuating how there might be a greenhouse element incorporated into Mars Ice Home. And thanks to this one, uh, thanks to this one image and representation, this also spun off into its own kind of challenge that we collaborated on with NASA Langley, which was known as the Big Ideas Challenge. And myself and uh, my colleague from Space Exploration Architecture were co-organizers of this challenge. And we basically uh, introduced a concept where 
teams uh, applying to the challenge would just would introduce a concept of operations as it's known uh, for a Martian greenhouse. So that was a nice offshoot of our project. And finally, to move into the last and final phase and iteration of the 3D printed habitat challenge, uh, Mars X House was the winner and final design in, uh, in, in this part of the challenge. And instead of working in water ice, we introduced a sulfur based regolith material for the construction of the habitat. Um, we incorporated the design of the habitat synthesizes multiple drivers ranging from Mars environmental drivers. So how do you address pressure, temperature, radiation and site selection on Mars? to human factors. So how do you address light and views to the exterior? How do you introduce functional programming uh, for, for your crew? And how do you introduce safety and redundancy measures for your crew? Um, and then constructability and mission drivers. So how do you incorporate pre-integrated components that are launched from Earth? How do you incorporate within your concept of operations a concept for entry, descent, and landing, autonomous assembly, and incorporating existing technologies such as for uh, environmental control and life support. Uh, so here's a view of X house from the exterior. Another view of X house with a rover approaching the habitat. And uh, it, it, in this phase, we were working collaboratively with Apis Core to think about how we might reimagine uh, their, their printer for the sake of deployment on Mars. So here you'll see uh, the Apis Core printer 3D printing basalt-based uh, reinforcement around the exterior of the habitat. And here's X house at night. And a view of uh, the crew quarters within X house where you'll notice the, the interior walls are white. That's because we incorporated high density polyethylene ethylene as the material for the um, inner layer of the habitat. So only the high density polyethylene, the plastic would be what interfaces with the astronauts. A view of the laboratory at the bottom level of the habitat and a view of the wardroom, which is essentially the common area recreation area for the crew of, uh, of, of the habitat. Uh, as I mentioned, we were interested in incorporating the, the I guess, the state of the art relative to the Apis core printer um, aboard a robotic chassis that can actually deploy uh, from a lander on the surface of Mars. And so we did a few payload calculations to determine whether this would actually work with the lander that we had in mind. And then we incorporated a concept for a pre-integrated mechanical core. So you'll see in the top right, the pre-integrated mechanical core houses uh, EFLIS and e uh, environmental control and life support equipment, as well as other MEP equipment that would be launched from Earth. And it serves as a scaffold for 3D printing um, horizontal areas of the habitat. This is a construction sequence that we generated for to demonstrate and simulate uh, 3D printing of the habitat itself. This was generated from a Revit model that was brought into Navis Works and uh, represents how we're imagining future kind of simulations of these types of uh, projects to happen. And we see that we see a, there's a lot of opportunity to incorporate common architecture, engineering, construction software tools with the ways that we will imagine construction on other planets to happen. And uh, here's a little snippet of the material layers within the habitat. You'll notice on the far inside, we have the high density polyethylene and then on the exterior, the regolith concrete, as well as multiple uh, types of uh, circumferential hoop reinforcement for that is made out of basalt fiber as well as diagonal reinforcement. So this is our material system and composite wall for X house. And this is just showing another view of the construction sequence itself, how the multiple materials would interface together and what the, the sequencing is for construction of the habitat. And this is a this is a, the model that was produced for X house, which has been uh, exhibited within the the Moving to Mars exhibition in London and is also, and, and now has been moved to the Technikstadt Museum in Stockholm. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the 3D printed habitat challenge was both design as well as construction prototyping. 
So in collaboration with APIS Core, we were working on some of the construction levels of the competition. This was a demonstration to show that we can actually just print a flat and level foundation for a future habitat. We, we won first prize in uh, this level of the competition and uh, conducted an impact test with uh, Olympic shot put, which as you see has been dropped from the top of that structure. Uh, and then thanks to a residency that we received with Autodesk Build Space in Boston, Massachusetts, we were able to complete this demonstration for construction level two of the competition. Essentially, this is a glorified, um, I shouldn't say glorified, this is, this is basically a, 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 a jacuzzi, a concrete jacuzzi. You'll notice on the right that uh, we have an ABB robotic arm that is lifting and lowering two pipes within this jacuzzi. The purpose of this demonstration was to show was a hydrostatic was a hydrostatic test. So not only did we have a digital signal going from the 3D printer to the robotic arm, but uh, after printing was done, we filled the structure up only 20 centimeters with water to demonstrate that no additional sealing or caulking would be required. And that was sufficient for us to win first prize in this level of the competition as well. So the porosity of the material and uh, water tightness of the material is quite a challenge. And uh, it's thinking, the idea for these demonstrations is to think ahead to the, to the ways in which we will need to create airtight, pressurizable uh, structures using 3D printed materials on the surface of other, of other planets. Um, so this was our demonstration of how the structure did not leak. Okay, now more recently, for the last year and a half, I'm very, very excited and honored to say that I've been working uh, first with Search and now directly with ICON on the Moon to Mars Planetary Autonomous Construction Technologies Initiative, which is a project led by NASA Marshall Space Flight Center uh, to, to conceive and deliver civic infrastructure on the Moon within this decade. Uh, this project is, is being thought of in multiple phases. The first will be a, an initial demonstration of additive technologies on the surface of the moon. Um, we will scale that up into deploying a, a demonstration payload on a large scale clips lander. Um, and then eventually we're thinking about how we can create landing pads, roadways, and eventually habitats on the surface of the moon. So Project Olympus is ICON's vision for a, permanent, uh, a permanently habitable uh, lunar base uh, that is constructed using the Olympus additive manufacturing system on the surface of the moon. Both Search as well as Bjarke Ingels Group Ingalls Group con uh, contributed to the concept design for the future lunar base. So this is what you see here. And uh, I'm excited that some of you who uh, worked on this project with me are, are, with, are with us today. And uh, the idea was to show and to conceive how the Olympus uh, additive manufacturing system can be used and what exactly a concept of operations would be for creating the civic infrastructure, for creating landing pads, roadways, and eventually habitats. So this is our vision of some of the landing pad. This is some of the landing pad schematic design that we uh, incorporated within the project. And the, uh, our concept for an initial and foundational habitat was referred to as the lunar lantern. So here you'll see some of the common areas of this habitat for a foundational uh, structure on the moon. Uh, our view of the wardroom, the communal area within the lunar lantern. And here's a view of the lunar lantern uh, on the exterior as it's being constructed. Okay, more recently, uh, ICON has recently completed a subscale demo of, of a landing pad. This is representative of, this is the first step in showing how we can actually build these, uh, build the civic infrastructure and landing pads on the moon. Uh, this was done in collaboration, of course, with NASA Marshall, the impact project, as well as a student led design team uh, that designed this landing pad. and. We were also able to uh, to achieve a hot fire test, such as you see here, to that was intended to sort of uh, s determine whether the the pad design would actually uh, control the plume effects of the rocket of the hot fire uh, of the rocket fire. Um, but in any event, it's a very exciting demonstration and the first step towards uh, realizing these projects in the long term. And I just want to end on some of the student work that uh, my students at Art Center have uh, put together for the recent Life on the Moon course. I think that 
overall, it's very exciting to see how much interest there is in this field and how real it's becoming and how um, and, and how inspiring it is to know that students and, and, and others all over the world are just so excited and so interested in this vision of future life in space and what the future of space tourism, for example, might be. And uh, it's a space ripe for innovation and it's a space that uh, is, is one of the more exciting to, I'm, I'm very excited and honored to be a part of. So with that, I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Well, thank you, Melody. Uh, that's um, that's really fascinating. I was just looking at you know the conversation on the chat. There's so many people. I mean, um, I, I know you didn't have the time to go through that, but there's so much excitement I can see uh, right now in the chat. We have a lot of questions already, like 14 questions right now. I don't know whether we're going to be able to tackle them all, but again, we're going to be able to take these in the LinkedIn group later on. So um, I'm going to start with the first questions. And you know, when we started discussing this and, and I heard about your work and I absolutely wanted you to be here in this conversation also with, 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 um, with Sophia, because you know, it's, it's, it's again, it's like, it's, it's innovation as a practice is about design. Okay, it's about emergent technologies but in a place which is really you know, pushing the boundaries. And, and so the first thing I want to ask is, until today, I heard a lot of things about going to Mars and, and now this is the moon and, and 2024, this is going to be the first you know, lunar stations on which you're working now. So what has changed from Mars to, to the moon? That's such a good question. Essentially, well, not a lot has changed is the, is the, is the short answer. Um, the moon is being envisioned as a platform to deploy future technologies to Mars. So it's a stepping stone to Mars. And we're imagining many of the technologies that are being uh, implemented and thought about that will be, be, be implemented for the moon will eventually enable us to also uh, settle and build on Mars. Um, the moon is a lot closer than Mars and, uh, and, and frankly, a lot more feasible in regards to uh, developing this critical infrastructure in a timely way. And uh, yeah, it's, it's when, when you think about the journey to the moon, which is only a couple of days versus the journey to Mars, which would be like six to eight months one way, um, and how much more dangerous it would actually be to get to Mars. And if you needed to evacuate, there is no evacuation on, on, you know, on, on a trip to Mars. You have to go through the rest of the journey. Um, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly dangerous and uh, it introduces a lot of risk to mitigate. So uh, for the time being, the moon is, is our next step and uh, it's a challenging one as it is. Thanks, Mary. Melody, uh, I wanted to thank you for, for this presentation. I've seen a lot of this content before. I've seen your work and I, I'm just blown away once again and inspired on so many levels. So, so you know, thanks for, for continuously wowing us. I think the, um, you know, the comments in the, in the chat just say it all. Um, thinking about the different skills that are necessary to, to bring these ideas to life, right? One of my questions was um, what, what groups and teams of experts and, and disciplines um, had to come together to work on this project, right? Uh, and, and also what made this group successful uh, and different from others? That's such a good question. Um, one of the things about uh, the various groups that I've worked with, and, and I think the consistent trend in all of the projects that I've contributed to is that they're extremely research intensive. Um, and research and relying on, I, I guess you could say, relying on the expertise of subject matter experts and consultants and others who are very involved in developing uh, the state of the art in regards to research in the many areas that space architecture and deployment of these construction technologies touch is a really critical part of what it means to put these proposals together. So in the early, in the early days, we, this basically just meant that we were calling people, emailing people randomly, uh, trying to assemble as many kind of experts and consultants and, and, and as much expertise as we, can, as we could to uh, assemble a proposal and synthesize what we felt was the latest and greatest work and research to date. Um, 
now it's it seems like the caliber and the the network that we have to draw from has just grown and expanded in such an amazing way uh, but still i think that research and synthesizing constraints and synthesizing the state of the art relative to what we know is at the core of these proposals very cool um, another thing that we, we talked about that was really interesting in, in the way you approached both um, innovation and won the competition is that it was design-led, right, rather than, than engineering-led. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, I think that for, for architecture in particular, incorporating uh, design thinking and incorporating kind of a creative approach towards problem solving is extremely unique and very different from the ways that uh, teams traditionally approach systems engineering problems within space flight. And uh, that's not to say that it's better or that it's worse. It's just a different way of thinking about how you can introduce new value and introduce new opportunities for a spatial experience. So uh, one example would be for Mars Ice House, uh, instead of adopting the kind of traditionally accepted uh, building construction material, which would have been to use soil, Martian soil as, uh, as our material, we opted very intentionally to use water ice. And uh, I don't think that would have been, I don't think that, I think that would have been just accepted as a constraint. And I don't think that many engineering workflows would have allowed for that kind of radical rethinking of what are we using? How are we going to use it? I mean, I find it fascinating because you, I mean, <laughs> when you mentioned just before that you, you did this as like a night, I mean, like a night job or, you know, friends back at the time and you won twice the competition. And and um, I saw the images of you basically being a small team, you know, against this behemoth of, you know, of engineering and, and trying to come to, to win the competition. So I'd be interested to hear from you, Melody, what, what do you think a small team like yours, you know, won against the, the biggest engineering, you know, firms that were competing at the time? That's a really good question. Um, it's true that Search Plus APIS Core was a very small team in comparison to the other finalists of the phase one challenge, which were Foster and Partners and the European Space Agency, who won second and third place. I think that being small and being, I think that being small and being kind of naive and, and new to the field uh, enables us to work or enabled us to work in a more agile way and enabled us to really think outside the box and experiment much more willingly than other teams may have been able to. Um, that would be my guess. I, and I also think that uh, in future phases, NASA Centennial Challenges was much more open and much more willing to sort of uh, well, well, they awarded much smaller teams in later phases, I'll say that. So that was a definite shift that I observed, uh, which was a very refreshing one because the barriers to entry in, in for the architectural and virtual levels of the competition were very low. You don't have to be from a large organization. Mm. You don't have to be from an institution. It's intended to just be a real like crowdsourcing uh, the project, you know, where they they seek the latest and greatest ideas from anybody. So uh, that's what those levels of the competition represented to me. That's amazing. Um, and, and this is something, you know, when we were discussing and preparing for these for these uh, for these webcasts, we mentioned that at the time, you know, NASA was coming with the concept that everything should be, you know, Done with dirt because this is the materials you're going to use uh, on, on planet Mars. Okay. And then you completely flip this and, and came with this idea of, of ice and to the point where, I mean, NASA were actually upset by, by you, you know, changing this. And so that's why the second competition, they, they put back the rule of using dirt. So um, for me, like ice, ice was, is almost like a, a paradigm shift in the way you, 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 you know, you, you innovating. So um, can you tell me more about, about how you, you came to this paradigm shift? Yeah, we, we didn't know, like, it, honestly, we, we were aware that most examples within space architecture and within and, and historically speaking that most examples of habitat construction uh, 
are done from regolith and we were aware of course like that would probably be the most commonly accepted solution um we didn't think that this would be a paradigm shifting concept there there are certainly I concepts and ideas for igloos all throughout the world but at the same time um, we were interested in the architectural possibilities of what it means to design differently with a new building construction material that has not been used for 3D printing before. One of the things about these uh, these these concepts, these concept designs, is that we it really forces you to think aspirationally about what could be possible versus what is possible today. And I think that Ice House and some of the later work that that uh, I was a part of really functioned in that way like what can we aspire to versus what is currently buildable and constructible using our technologies today so it serves as a what's been referred to as like a forcing function to really move us along and think differently about how we might be able to advance the state of the art for the future instead of just relying on what we know will work right now right. one idea that's connected to this that i find really fascinating is that of um designing for the extremes, right? This is definitely, we, we can all agree that um, the conditions you're, you're designing for or against um, are quite extreme, probably the most extreme that we can think of. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about, about this and, and how it really affects the way, the way you had to innovate? Definitely, definitely. Designing for the extreme is at the core of what it means to think about um, how you can introduce programming and services for future life uh, on, on the Mars and on Mars and, and the moon. It really forces you to think about, well, what are the foundational and fundamental elements of what you need to survive and what you need to, to thrive uh, and, and to, to live like live comfortably, right? So you need air, water, food, and all of these need to come from somewhere if they're not launched from Earth. So how do you introduce sustainable resources for everything that you need to, to sustain life and to, and to live comfortably? Um, yeah, so those are some of the, the drivers for why it's, it's, why it's so uh, fundamental to think about, um, you know, where our resources come from both in terms of like air, water, and uh, and food and energy, and uh, and and what that's going to mean for the deployment of a habitat in the future. So this is this is high seas, the analog in Hawaii. It's really interesting that uh, these analogs are really they they really serve as a test bed for many elements of 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 a mission and many elements of. Um, of you know thinking thinking about future life and what exactly we're going to be uh, designing for. And what is this so, one? This this is Eden ISS. This is an experiment going on in Antarctica where they're looking at how to uh, basically how how to uh, operate a greenhouse within an extreme environment. Sorry, Safi, you had a question. That's maybe. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to ask, you know, some of the questions that come up in these cases, um, you know, revolve around the, the, the idea that, you know, why are we trying to, why are we spending so much time and energy designing uh, and solving for, um, you know, for life on the moon or life on, on, on planets, while we have so many problems here on, on, on planet Earth, right? Um, and on the other hand, you know, you, you start seeing how these experiments um, constrain us and force us to start thinking about how um, we have to live with finite resources. You know, you're you are in a in a in a small constrained environment, and you have to uh, to to live with with what you have. And you know, one could definitely extrapolate that to our situation on the planet. You know, there's a finite environment, finite resources. We we're starting to see the 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 constraints and the the, the boundaries of, of those um, those resources. So um, you know my question here would be from from the work you're doing, um, is there any intent, any discussions about gathering learning uh, that is learnings that are meant to be applied back to to our planet? Definitely, definitely. And I think that um, earlier in my presentation when I was talking about like the immediate application of 3D printing and the future application of 3D printing to build habitats, 
I think that for much of the work that's happening in space development and space technology today, that crossover between an Earth application and a future space application is extremely significant. And it's a, a real driver for commercial development in this area. So how do you introduce uh, services, products, technologies, et cetera, that have applications for space, but also applications for Earth? Um, in particular, I mean, 3D printing is a, is a key example here. So it introduces uh, a material efficient, safe method of constructing, of automated construction that is going to enable us to build more cheaply and faster in the future so that we can serve the needs of low income communities and even homelessness. Um, and then of course, uh, being a robotic technology for the future, it's going to enable us to build on the surface of the moon and Mars, where it is way, way too uh, extreme and too dangerous to assume that we're going to build our own habitats ourselves, meaning humans ourselves. Yeah. So, I mean, designing for the extreme, and th that's question is actually for you, Safir. Um, and when we're talking about, because you're a designer also, and designer at VF and Van, so I I'll be curious to see how the work, the work that a Melody is doing when it, talks, when, when it comes to designing for the extreme could influence or you know impact the way you're thinking about designing for the extreme in a context of, of an apparel brand and, and I'm referring this to the North Face because we talked a lot about you know North Face being a brand which is really technical this is around, around you know um, you know confronting the extremes of, of environment. Now this, this is why I'm, I was so inspired by by what I was seeing not only by what I was seeing the visuals and, and the final solutions but specifically the, the thought process and the approach right um, and I also loved um, you know some of the the mentions that that uh, melody uh, made to for instance I think it was uh, ISRU in situ uh, resource utilization um, also sustainable materials that enhance performance um, those are those are fundamental principles that um, you know we we are thinking about you know when we innovate um, you know there's innovation around materials there's innovation around processes how do we how can we actually bring product to the market um, in a much more efficient way in a in a way that maybe utilizes a lot less resources more localized resources um, how do we think about um, the environment in which the product is being used and how can we maximize the performance of, of that product how can we think about the overall experience not just the product you know these are these are um, you know thought patterns and, and thought processes that are that, that I think you know could definitely uh, learn a lot from from your approach and, and the work you've been you've been doing super inspiring question back to Melody and I'm checking I want to be mindful of time because we, we have now 32 questions in the Q&A so it's really <laughs> become a lot uh, which is amazing so uh, one um, quick question for you Melody um, when we prepare for this interview um, you know I've mean I've met a lot of people that work in this the space of speculative design and speculative future and I mean the conversation on Mars and 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 well, Mars and Moon to an extent was really about you know spec speculative future and you've been in you know by the time I was I was working with these different people you and you've been in a place where um, going to Mars was something speculative to becoming a reality but it's been a long journey and, and I'll be curious because you've been there from speculation now to being you know building something for 2024 so um, you know how do you keep kept faith basically uh, and not, not just give up in that journey? That's a great question. Um, some of it is just a belief that this work will pay off. Uh, I certainly have had, well, but I, I'll say that for the 3D printed habitat challenge because it was a multi-year competition and because I was involved pretty heavily uh, full time for, for quite a bit of it. There were moments where in which I, I felt like, well, well, how is this going to materialize? How is this actually going to become real? Because it seems like most everything that we're doing in terms of design is is just concept. It is just schematic and it's, it's images, it's images only. But um, the more I kind of pressed on and the more, it, it, the more I, I really can, or as a team, we really contributed to those visions and, and 
uh, believed and had conviction that this work was important and valuable, uh, the more it became real and we developed synergies with other teams, with other companies and other researchers. And uh, it's, it's one of those things where you, you kind of, you're determined to see it through and that's exactly what we did. And I like some of the, the image you share with us because it really illustrates this, this idea of speculative, but actually that's not that speculative. What was the intent of that, that visual here? I think this was, so this is an image that was generated by, oh, what is his name? Yuzaku Maze, uh, Mezawa, I'm butchering that name, mm. sorry. He's the Japanese billionaire that is uh, sponsoring this Dear Moon, a uh, crowdsourced mission to the moon. And this is uh, his, I, I believe this is his vision of bringing arts into space mm -hmm. and, and how significant that is. And I think that his original vision was to send an artist to the moon or send an artist to space. And that has evolved into uh, basically like a, a social media campaign to, uh, to ask for for future crew members, civilian crew members, uh, to travel to the moon or and around the moon. One, and can you tell, tell us more about this one here? This is the interior of uh, the Virgin Galactic ship that is also uh, planned for, for to, to 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 travel around the moon and to experience a moonrise. So it's 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 unbelievable how the landscape of commercial development for the moon has changed so rapidly so much that we're so much so that we're seeing civilian space travel uh, becoming a reality today like this is not happening in a few years this is happening within the next year that uh, these these civilian and uh, commercial spaceflight programs are really like picking their crew members so that these things will happen um, that's historic, there, there has never been a civilian crew before. Uh, if you think about how rigorous astronaut training is for NASA and how rigorous they are in terms of like, uh, just approving astronauts in terms of like the medical kind of uh, uh, requirements that, they're, that they need to meet. This is, a, this is a real kind of paradigm shifting moment for us when it comes to space flight. Amazing. Um, I'm just uh, gonna check. Safi, do you have a last question for Melody before we open this to a Q&A? Yeah, I know there are a number of questions, but I, I wanted to maybe take it uh, to a slightly different level and ask you a little bit more of a personal question. Um, and that question is, what, what was your experience as a woman and a minority in this field? You know, was it a challenge? I think that it's a, it's a really great question and it is a personal question. There isn't a, a straightforward answer to that. The, my gut reaction is to say that, you know, as somebody who sort of entered this field and, and, and submitted to the Centennial Challenge just like as an unknown, right? Like, no, because I, there, there were no more, uh, there were no more a kind of restraints or constraints against me than there were anyone else uh, to to apply thinking to these problems and put these pro proposals together. Having worked internally at NASA though, I know that the story is a little bit more complicated than that. And representation of women and minorities within science and engineering field is something that, uh, that needs to be worked on and that should be addressed. And I think that should be part of a larger discourse about, um, well, what are some systemic barriers to being more inclusive in space and in aerospace and in science and research more generally? So I, I see multiple sides to this, to this story, which is that on the one hand, you don't want to be like the token woman or the token minority within any team or with any group. Um, you actually want to be recognized for the work that you're doing and the intrinsic value of the work and let it speak for itself. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of like talk now about how you don't want to be a woman entrepreneur, you don't want to be a woman engineer, you just want to be an engineer, you want to be an, an entrepreneur, like you don't need to allow your you, your gender doesn't need to speak to who you are, or what you're doing. 
But on the other hand, there is the, there's this other kind of side to this argument and there's this other side to um, what I think it, it means to advocate as a minority and advocate for additional representation within the field that I kind of uh, conflict with sometimes, but um, I think things are, are, are changing slowly but surely. And I think that, uh, that especially the newer companies uh, are much more inclusive and much more um, uh, supportive of a diverse workspace and diverse opinions and bringing in others that uh, maybe don't have the traditional backgrounds. Thank you, Melody. Um, so on, only four minutes left, but again, uh, for everyone, and Jay is going to post the link here, we have this LinkedIn group. Uh, we invite you to join that group. We're going to be posting uh, the questions here, and Melody will you know, um, herself respond to this question as much as she can. I know she's very busy, but she, she'll be actively involved here, as well as Safir. So don't hesitate to you know, uh, join the, the LinkedIn group. I'm gonna pick a few here. I mean, randomly, there's 37 questions which is pretty uh, uh, amazing. So um, first question from Marit. Um, I'd like to ask the following question. Won't 3D printing take too much time? Take too much time. Yeah, my question is that, as opposed to what? Um, there, there are, there are other ways of building, certainly with like bagged regolith or incorporating inflatable structures, incorporating hard shell, prefabricated launch from earth habitats that uh, are ready to go and more similar and more along the lines of something like the lunar module, which is like that characteristic image that, that, uh, that we have um, of what it means to land on the moon. But, um, I, I think that the, not that I think the, the real value add of 3D printing and of using ISRU that we spoke about earlier and using local and indigenous materials is that it is, in my opinion, the most sustainable strategy to scale and to expand how we're going to be building and how we're going to be constructing so that we're never limited by payload mass, we're never limited by how expensive it is to launch these uh, technologies and, these, and this hardware from earth and uh, essentially robotics that deploy on the surface of the moon and Mars can use what's there to uh, autonomously create these structures. Hmm. Another question from Scott. These are fantastic designs, but essentially single habitats. Do you have ideas that would allow expansion? That's a great question. Thank, I, I appreciate that question a lot. Um, because Scott. most of these habitat proposals are responses to a brief generated by NASA. We're also addressing the requirements and, and the considerations and specifications of that brief. And more often, and, and until very recently with the Olympus project, this has only been for a single habitat. So scalability and expanding to, uh, to, 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 to larger, I guess you could say settlements or clusters and collections of habitats is absolutely the way that we should and need to be thinking. Um, it just so happens to be that the scope of the work that we've done so far has focused on like a foundational habitat for a crew of four. Great. And I'm only one last question. So frustrating. There's so many good questions here, but again, we, we're going to, we're going to capture all of them. Last one. I really want to make sure we tackle is from somebody who says, what type of path you would recommend to a new bachelor graduate who wants to specialize as a space architect? Uh, I'm so glad that, that we got to, that we get to talk about this question. Uh, First, I think that there's a very, that there is a very extensive community of space architects uh, online, and I would encourage you to, to connect with them. Um, there are multiple publication and conference opportunities to share work that you're doing both academically or outside academics professionally. So I would encourage you to put that work out there, publish within those conferences, uh, put your work online, share that work online. There's always going to be a community and an audience that is interested to see that work and uh, engage as much as, much as you can uh, with uh, people working in the field and um, and yeah, do I, I would say if it's something that you're passionate about, then put yourself out there, do the work and don't let anything stop you. 
Melody, thank you so much for this last advice. Uh, this is really valuable. Thank you so much for, I mean, uh, taking the time with us. That was that was really amazing to you know share your experience and your journey for, with everyone here. So um, yes, um, for everyone, you know, we'll meet you back on the LinkedIn group. Thank you so much for having attended this um, this uh, webcast, and I'll see you uh, next month. Thank you, Safir. Also, thank you for joining us today. Bye now. Thank you all. Thanks, thank Melody. You. Bye, Eric. Bye, Sophia. Thank you both.